Hi, my name is Benta, I'm the Norris Witch, and this week's video is the second video in the series on the runes. And today we're talking about the history and the origin of the runes. But first, patron shoutout. Thank you really much to Rhiannon, Dario, Soren, Brayden, Diego, Hannah, Tell, Timothy, Bjorn, Scylla, Ash, Lucy, and Jels. And now let's hop back in time. Okay, history and origin of runes. This will be an interesting video to film since uh, I will have to pronounce a lot of names and also especially Germanic tribe names in English, which will be interesting. So I will probably mispronounce every single name. I'm sorry in advance. So the first thing to note, of course, as always, I feel like, is that we don't know for sure where the runes came from and how they developed. It's not like there is a rune stone where someone wrote exactly the history of the runes, who invented them and how they were used. We have to kind of look at archaeological finds and then kind of reconstruct theories on where the runes came from. And that is what we will look at today. As I said already in the last video, this is just what I learned from the books that I read. So it's possible that maybe something that I'm saying in this video is already outdated. I'm not a historian, I'm not an archaeologist, so take everything that I tell you with a grain of salt. But let's start. We can basically divide the period in which the runes were used in two periods. The first one is the one where the Elder Futhark was used, and the second period was the one where all the other alphabets were developed. So the Younger Futhark, for example, and the Anglo-Saxon Futhark. But let us first, of course, look at the first period. The oldest runic find that I personally know of, at least, is from 160 AC. So that is at least how old the runic alphabets are. If we look at inscriptions from that first period, so the very old inscriptions, they all look kind of similar. They all portray similar runes. And that suggests that all the runes that were used in different regions all had the same origin because they all kind of look the same. And this alphabet back then is what we call now the Elder Futhark. All the inscriptions that we have found this far from that time are pretty short. They're usually people's names or names that were given to objects. So people usually inscribed their own names on their property or they gave names to their property and carved these names into it. So all of them are more kind of private types of inscriptions. All these early finds of runic inscriptions are from around southern Sweden and Norway, Denmark and the coast of the North Sea in Germany. And that will be important later on, so don't forget about that. <laughs> And yeah, as I already said, the alphabet that was used in this first period, that's now called the Elder Futhark, that is where all the other runic alphabets developed from. And now we come into the second period of the use of the runes. And that kind of started when languages and cultures developed kind of differently in different regions. So the regions where the runes were used, it was a big region. So of course, in different regions, different languages and different cultures started to develop. So this one alphabet wasn't really able to portray all of these languages anymore. There were kind of new sounds that were used in some regions that, yeah, the alphabet just couldn't portray. It just didn't work for these languages anymore. So. What did the people do? Of course, they adapted the runic alphabet that they already used, so new alphabets were developed. And those were, for example, the Younger Futhark, the Anglo-Saxon Futhark, you name it. There are a lot of newer <laughs> Futhark alphabets, and yeah, these all developed from the Elder Futhark in this second period. The first Futhark alphabet that developed in this time was the Younger Futhark, and that developed around the 7th century, and after that, for example, the Anglo-Saxon Futhark developed around the 9th century. And of course, these dates aren't definitive facts, <laughs> because we can just go from the archaeological finds that we have, and yeah, the first inscriptions in these alphabets are from around that time, so that is just what we can go off of. And you see, if you are a lot into the Vikings, and Viking history, Viking culture, 
and you want to work with the runes, then you see maybe you should work with the younger Futhark instead of with the elder Futhark, because the Vikings used the younger Futhark. Because, yeah, the elder Futhark wasn't used anymore back then. What I also find really interesting is that around the 9th century, on the mainland, like for example in Germany, the runes weren't used anymore. They were still used quite a long time around like Scandinavia, so Sweden, Norway, and also in Britain, for example, or in Iceland, but in Germany, for example, not really anymore. At least we haven't found any inscriptions from after the 9th century yet. And yeah, those are kind of the two periods in which we can divide the usage of the runes. I personally find that really interesting, how you can like look at the inscriptions that you have and then derive kind of the history of these alphabets from these archaeological finds. But what's even more fascinating is looking at where the runes actually came from. Was there just a person who was like, ah oh, yeah, it would be kind of convenient to be able to write down stuff, so I want to invent an alphabet and who then invented the Elder Futhark? or if the runes were actually derived and adapted from another alphabet. And there are actually, I know of at least, of um, five theories about where the runes came from. So let us look at these, because I personally also find them really interesting. The first thing, of course, to note, again, we don't know if any of these origins are true. I guess the thing that most makes sense is that not only one of these theories is true, but that actually a mixture of them will have taken place. So these are just theories. But let's still talk about them because they are really fascinating. So the first theory is the Latin theory that was formulated by LFA Wimmer in 1874. And as the name already suggests, <laughs> it says that the runes were derived from the Latin alphabet. Supposedly, that was the result of increased contact between the Romans and some Germanic tribes, starting around the 2nd century BC with the first invasions of the Cimbri and the Teutons around the Danube and the Rhine area. The Latin theory says that these Germanic tribes adopted the Latin alphabet and then developed the runes from them. And then from the Danube and Rhine area, this runic alphabet spread more into the north and into the east. But there is one big argument against this theory, and that is that, as we have learned already, the first runic finds were around northwestern Germany and Denmark. So the theory that the runes developed in the Danube Rhine area doesn't really make sense then, right? The second theory is the Greek theory, and that was formulated by Sophos Bugge in 1899. This theory says that the Goths actually adopted a version of the Greek italic script after a period of contact with the Hellenic culture at the coast of the Black Sea. But that doesn't really make sense time-wise, because the period of contact between the Goths and the Greeks was around the 2nd century AC, while the first runic finds are older than that. So let us look into the third theory, which is the Etruscan theory. That one was formulated by CJS Marstranda, no clue how to pronounce that name, <laughs> in 1928, but it was refined and reworked multiple times, for example, in 1937 by Wolfgang Krause. This theory says that Germanic tribes in the Alps, so pretty far south, adopted an alphabet by northern Etruscan people very early on, maybe even before 300 BC. The Cimbri tribe then supposedly learned that alphabet from the Germanic people in the Alps and then passed it on to the Suebi people. From there it spread around the Rhine area, to the coast of the North Sea, to Jutland, so Denmark, and from there it spread even further. And there is actually no huge argument against this theory, but the period of contact between these Germanic tribes in the Alps and the northern Etruscan people was around 300 to 400 years earlier than the first runic finds that we have. And also there is no Etruscan alphabet that could have been the sole precursor of the runic alphabets. 
The fourth theory is the theory of native origin. It was formulated in 1896 by R.M. Meyer and it got really popular during the Second World War in Germany. Yay, we know where that's going. This theory says that the runic alphabets were actually a native invention by the Germanic peoples and that it was actually the precursor for the Greek and the Phoenician alphabets. Yeah, sure. Of course, the theory that the runes were actually a native invention by the Germanic peoples is very unlikely in itself, but the theory that the runic alphabets were the precursor for the Phoenician alphabet isn't possible because the oldest Phoenician alphabet is much older. But I mean, of course this theory got really popular because, I mean, Germanic pride, right? German shame, German shame. So let us quickly leave that theory behind and move on to the fifth theory, which is the Phoenician theory. This theory says that the runes were developed from a Western variation of the Phoenician alphabet, and exactly that Phoenician alphabet that was used during the Carthaginian Empire around 300 BC. We know that the Carthaginians were a powerful seafarer nation, and they had a lot of colonies around Europe, for example, around the coast of the North Sea in German and Denmark, exactly the region where the oldest runic inscriptions are from. Hmm, interesting. The Carthaginians used their alphabets for trading purposes, so it's very likely that they also wanted to use their alphabet in the colonies in Germany and Denmark, so they probably taught it to the Germanic people there because they wanted to trade with them. So it's also pretty likely that the runes were then developed from that alphabet. What's also really interesting is that there are a lot of similarities between this Phoenician alphabet and the runes. One example is that both alphabets start with the letter F and in both alphabets the letter F means cattle. So these were all the theories that I personally know of. If you know more, put them in the comments because I find this topic so interesting. For some reason I find it so interesting to just imagine how people back then like traded and got in contact and then learned each other's alphabets and languages and how then completely new alphabets were developed. I think that's just completely mind-blowing and just really, really interesting. So of course, I really hope that you also found this interesting. I hope you learned a little bit. And yeah, if you did, make sure to subscribe and give a thumbs up and maybe follow me on Instagram or check out my online shop or maybe even consider becoming my patron. And I will see you in the next video. Bye!